Okay, well, my name is Nate, if you haven't met me already. A um, couple of announcements. There are solutions to the homework exercises, which will be posted online, I think, later today. Um, there are no official office hours, but I'll hang out after Michael Hutchings' lecture today in case you have any questions. Um, all right, so welcome to the Polyfolds discussion. The primary purpose is that I suspect that if you hadn't seen Polyfolds before Monday, then you're bewildered about at least part of what's been said. Um, you know, like some piece of terminology that doesn't make sense, like maybe you think, what the heck is this um, partial quadrant for or whatever else. So I'd like to take your questions and clarify whatever questions you have. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to you. What questions do you have? Well, it's not a question, but can you show some examples of n polyfolds which are weird? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I can do that right now. So. Here's a question for my quals. Um, where to go? Sorry. Are these your notes from your quals? These are not my notes from quals. Uh -huh. Sorry. They didn't seem to be covered in tear stains. Uh -huh. Okay, here we go. So th this is a retract, which is locally finite dimensional, um, but where the dimension varies within connected components. This is something that Joel alluded to earlier today. And this is also homework question number five. Um, so the fact is that there exists a retract which is homeomorphic to the following subset of R2. So this is supposed to be the right half plane union with the uh, x-axis, not, not including the y-axis. Does this? Thank you. Um, right. So, does this satisfy your definition of weird umut? Yeah. <laughs> I, I can ask weird. You told, uh, this thing is like built up out of the union of things that are themselves manifolds, finite union. Um, you have, are there examples which do not? That's well, can we first look I, at this? Actually, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time when I need to say something. <laughs> so, if you build this from finite dimensional manifolds, right, you would take the real line and glue it into half space with this equivalence relation over the positive real line. And this is exactly what happens when you try to do Kuranishi regularization. The topology, the quotient topology that you then get on this space is not good. <laughs> it is not even first countable. In fact, it, so it is not metrizable. Mm. Um, whereas the topology that polyfold theory puts on this is as a subset of a scale Banach space, so it's perfectly metrizable. And it's, it's absolutely key that we have a metrizable topology for anything. So I must have been mistaken when I said homeomorphic to this. Or I guess no, 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 well, no it's no, homeomorphic to that no, subset no. of R2. Oh, okay, and you're saying that, for instance, Kronichi structures would have put a different topology on it, which would have yeah, not been... The topology, yes. you guys, is not, is not the subset. <laughs> subset. Um, all right, so the idea of this is that we're going to fix some function, some bump function beta. And... Um, for t a real number, um, we're going to write down a, involute, or a retraction on a function space, which is just projection to beta, but shifted by a certain amount depending on t. Uh, and I should have said, I'm sorry, for t greater than 0.
and then for t less than or equal to zero, just consider the zero map. Um, and so the funny thing that's going on here is that um, so t is living in the x axis, and as you come in from the right, so t is getting um, smaller and smaller, and e to the one over t is shooting off to infinity. So you're projecting onto this series of bung functions which are shooting off to infinity. And the interesting thing about scale smoothness here is that um, these maps behave sort of smoothly at zero. So something funny happens at zero, but we're going to get a scale smooth map. Now, what is so your what are bug function? I, I'm very confused. Your bug function is going from R to where? I'll, I'll write it down now, but it's going to go from R to R. But then where does this bracket thing? Uh, so this is the subspace in L2 R comma R span by that shifted bump function. Oh, so that's sitting inside. Yes, yeah, so you didn't explain where that's sitting inside. <coughs> that's sitting inside this infinite dimensional space L2 of R R. Yes. Yeah. And I'll write that down. I'll write a precise definition down now. Yeah. So let's set E to be the scale Bonnach space, which is, well, the kth level is HK delta K functions from R to R. Uh, where we've chosen an increasing sequence of deltas starting from zero. Okay. Um, and now the retraction or the candidate retraction, little r, goes from r times c to r times, or sorry, r times e to r times e. And it's defined by sending the pair t little e. To the projection onto beta t when t is greater than zero. I'll write it in this in a second. Beta t means the shifted bump function. Oh, I'm sorry. I should call the function f. Excuse me. Okay. Gosh. Oh, that's inner product. Of, yes. Oh, the L2 inner product of that. Oh, that makes mistake. So we've now set a world record for bad notation, so I'm sorry. Give yourself an R coordinate also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So this is supposed to be a map to R comma. L2, so happy, good, okay. Any other objections? Great. Um, and so I think it's clear that the image of little r is um, homeomorphic, or maybe you don't believe the continuousness, but it's plausibly homeomorphic to the subset I drew above, where the x-axis is little t. And um, well, so the, the fiber living above any particular positive t in the fixed point set um, is going to be the subspace in h0 span by beta t. And the fiber over anything non-positive is just 0. Sorry, Nate. Uh, yeah. I'm going to be really, really annoying, and I'm sorry. But could you rewrite what you wrote in the bracket there? It's, it's... You mean right here? Yeah. You wrote something just beside it, I think. Yeah. It has to be a retraction, so it's just the first coordinate t. Yeah, so I had accidentally written only the second component of this retraction. This is supposed to be t comma the projection of f onto the subspace spanned by beta t.
OK. And it's the L2 inner product. It's the, yes, it's the L2 inner product. So H0 equals E0, I guess. Yes. All right, so now before I move on to proving some amount of smoothness, uh, any confusions about this definition? What does beta look like you did mention? Ah, yes. Well, it doesn't really matter. It's a bump function with, um, with H, the H0 norm equal to 1. Um, so why don't we just say it's, you know, that. And, you know, and let's say it's in C infinity. Do you need delta zero to be zero, or can it also be like yesterday delta zero was positive as well? Um, Do you need, really need it? I think probably if if it was positive and you also made this h zero comma delta zero, then it would probably work. The question is if, if delta zero were positive and not zero, would this still work? Delta zero is the. That is this. What? We see the h zero norm is not the case. No, but if you replaced that by the. It's compact. It's No, but you can't forget the first one. You don't see the decay anyway. But I don't know if it. You should not. Presumably, delta zero, if you work on anything, it should be zero. Anyway, it really doesn't matter because it's an example. So let's just say that delta zero is zero. Okay. Okay. Um, and let me just, before I prove that this thing is somewhat smooth, um, is everyone happy about this claim that the image of little r is, is this set that I drew in R2? OK. I'll take your word for it. All right. Um, so I'm not going to prove that little r is uh, like SC infinity anywhere because, or everywhere because that would take forever, but I can at least show that the difference quotient condition is satisfied for proving SC oneness um, at points of the form 0, comma f. I mean, but before, like how, this, how would you even dream that this would be shown? And, I mean, you draw this and how can you tell if it's a, uh, is there a criterion to say it's a polyform or not M polyform? <laughs> I mean, this, how do you think about this? this is, uh, does it come up somewhere? Yeah, well, this is, I mean, this is actually an important example because it's not exactly the same, but it's related to the plus gluing. Um, because in plus gluing, well, you're not projecting onto some bump function, but you're multiplying by um, bump functions where, where something is shooting off to infinity. And you need... Um, smoothness of the retraction that corresponds to that. Um, so the same sort of, you know, the, the same reason that this is SC smooth is at least part of why the, the retraction, which is projection onto the kernel of minus gluing, is SC smooth. Mm -hmm. What's the significance of the axis, the negative axis in that? Um, yeah, I guess it's not exactly analogous, but the idea is that in that projection to minus gluing, when A is equal to 0, you're doing nothing if you project to the kernel of minus gluing. Um, yeah, I, I would have to think about whether it's exactly the same. But there's something drastic happening at A is equal to 0 in that case, and when T goes non-positive in this case. You could, of course, take. Uh so you have this family beta t. You could take identity minus beta t, and then you would have a polyfold where you lose one dimension. <coughs> it would be up to there everything, the whole space, and then suddenly you have a, a hyperspace. Right. OK. Great. So, so it, it turns out to be true that um, R is SC infinity and therefore a scale smooth retract um, with the differential defined like so.
Okay. Let's see. So in the case that t is positive, this will be sigma comma negative sigma one over t squared exp of one over t, then the quantity f times beta prime beta plus f times beta, and then plus var phi beta beta. Yes. No. Um, I claim that it's trivial for t negative, but it's not trivial for t positive. But I think that the most interesting thing is happening at t equals zero. Okay. Um, so anyway, th this looks horrible, but it turns out that it's not easy to come up with that candidate. But anyway, I'm not going to use this because I'm only going to be looking at what happens near or at t equals zero. So let's just show that um, if we write that r is equal to um, t comma p of t f, so p is just the second component of r, the component mapping to e, then p is sc1 at a point of the form 0 comma F. Okay, so let's show that the difference quotient for that statement indeed goes to zero. Um, yes, sorry. So the difference quotient is uninteresting when sigma is negative because then it's just identically zero. So what you end up needing to prove is that if you look at the limit as sigma decreases to 0 and phi goes to 0 in h1 delta 1. And then the thing you're looking at is um, let's see, f beta sigma beta sigma plus var phi beta sigma beta sigma and then you're doing h0 divided by sigma plus the h1 delta 1 norm of var phi, you claim that this limit is equal to 0. Um, so what this thing is, is it's just um, you know, p evaluated at sigma comma t plus f. And then the other two terms vanish. Okay, And then we'll say that this is less than or equal to the limit of following two quantities summed. I'm super confused. Why does that horrible expression you wrote at the top not appear down here? It's because the differential that appears in here is the differential at um, t is equal to 0. And, yeah. Yeah. Is there some way to copy the differential in for example, I mean, can you actually different, differentiate something and get the expression above, or did you, did you have to come <laughs> up with this? You're asking, how did I get that candidate for the differential? Um, I claim that if, you're, if you pretend to be a calculus student who believes that everything is true, if you do the you know, Taylor series approximation, then this candidate will easily pop out if you just write down what the differential is supposed to approximate. OK. If you're tired of this example, I promise that I'm almost done. OK, so we need to show that, that this limit is equal to 0. Um, and let's just prove this for one of these factors, and then the other one is really similar. Um, so let's look at um, this guy here. So the numerator is. Uh, the product of f and beta sigma, and then beta sigma taking the h0 norm. But the h0 norm of beta sigma is 1. So we just get the absolute value of this inner product. 
Um, but because the H0 norm of beta sigma is 1, that's bounded by the H0 norm of f. So that means that this expression here is bounded by the H0 norm of f over absolute value of sigma. Okay. Um, but then, right, we assume that, oh, I'm sorry. And when I say h0, I mean h0 only. Yeah, sorry. The only thing I'll use about the inner product is that beta sigma is a bump function on e to the negative 1 over sigma comma e to the negative 1 over sigma plus 1. Yes. OK. And now we can bound this by some exponential. Yes, f restricted to this. I mean, only take the h0 norm of f on this interval. I see. So that goes with the h0 on that. So you're restricting f to that sub interval. Right, right. So now we're using the fact that that f is on the h1 level and therefore on the e1 level and therefore it's an h1 comma delta one. So you can bound this by e to the negative delta one times e to the one over sigma minus one f h1 delta one over absolute value of sigma. And then you know that this is just some constant. We're not, you know, this is fixed before we take the limit. Um, and this quantity goes to 0 faster than sigma does. So therefore, this quantity is going to 0. You said a bunch of stuff before that last inequality, and I did not entirely understand. OK. Yeah, so what I was saying is that beta sigma is supported on this interval right here. I'm okay with the second and last one. Oh, just this one here. If you write down the definition of h1 comma delta 1, then this just pops out immediately because this norm is the h1 norm of exp negative delta 1 mod s times f. So if, if you just write down the definition of this weighted Sobel of space, this pops out. I think you have to say that f has to be, in order to take the differential on the first level. Yes, that's right. So I didn't write it down. But in order to, we only need this difference quotient to go to 0 for f in the first level. And therefore, this norm is finite. Yeah. OK. Um, and um, this sort of raises the importance of the fact that we chose this particular gluing profile that um, our functions were shooting off to infinity like x 1 over sigma. If they've been going off to infinity much slower than that, this limit might not have ended up being 0. Faster is OK. Faster is OK for this limit, yeah. Does it remain OK for all future limits or just uh... Uh, If you choose some gluing profile going to infinity much faster than exponential, would there ever be a problem? Well, it shouldn't. Os I mean, I think if it oscillates a lot, maybe it's not so good. But if it sort of grows rather fast in a sort of you not know, oscillatory level in all all derivatives, it's fine. But it's not. So the worst case is minus one half one one over two pi logarithm of, of sigma. That's the worst case, which unfortunately is precisely what you would use in gluing and delay Mumford theory. But that is in some sense a degenerate theory. <laughs> okay. Um, next question. Actually, could you reiterate the information about the topology of this thing? Because I think that is an important point. I mean, that's something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think I'll be able to say and see anything sensible about why this retract should actually be homeomorphic to the subspace of R two. But if you can, then. Right. Well, I mean, just like about, I'm not sure I could say anything coherent off that, but I mean, like, what the topology of like a retract is, like, it comes from. Well, you know, by definition, it's inherited from the topology of the ambient scale Bonnach space, the zeroth level of that. 
but I don't know if that's the sort of thing you had in mind. Um, yeah, so presumably it's, it's um, some fairly easy exercise to show that this is homeomorphic to that subspace of R2. All right. No, I, uh, so before we move, what, what about three legs? Oh, you're asking, asking you're asking, could you get this That's as? problem, I don't know. Oh. I cut out, yeah. So that, I wonder, so, so the thing is, look at retracts uh, where, so where, where the image lies in the, the, the image should be in the smooth part, so it has a tangent space everywhere. You have, remember, we have the filtration. So look for a retract where the image is in the smooth part, yeah, right. which usually happens for low dimensional things. And so that you have a, then you have a tangent space everywhere and assume that the tangent space everywhere is one dimensional. So a, a one dimensional manifold would be an example. But what it seems to be possible are things when you have bifurcating off branches. So sort of, sort of in this same derivative. So so that could be like two things coming together, then have the same tangent space when they come together. So that I don't know. So, so there could be retractions uh, which have this as an image. So the exercise would be, well, I don't know how to do it, to take this thing and embed it into some banner space and see if you can retract it. So it's possible that branched that, 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 so that something like branched one-dimensional manifolds are actually retracts. But then it wouldn't be a problem still, hmm? because now d squared equals zero wouldn't be ruined by this, for example. No, because, because in the end we will actually no, get no, no, manifolds. No, no, no. no. Yes. So, so the thing is that our the solutions of our fragile problems are strong retracts. Maybe yeah. the retraction goes into one level higher is a retraction. So the retraction which you get go from E into E1. And then they're actually really manifolds. So so that so if you would yes, you're right. If you you could presumably do a Fretholm theory where you get perhaps this kind of things out. But then you would have this kind of issue. I mean unless you have some other structure like weights or whatever. Yeah, but the, but the Freytown theory, which uh, Joel told you about, actually produces real manifolds. So that branching phenomenon doesn't exist. As the zero set of a, of a transverse red hill, right. Um, maybe the last thing I can mention about this example is that it's a good exercise to compute the tangent space to this scale retract. Um, in particular, you might wonder, what is the dimension of the tangent space at the origin? So I'll leave that as a mystery. Um, yeah, so any uh, other questions? What are some things that are definitely not n <laughs> Non measurable sets. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Probably counter set. Is that <clears throat> I mean, you know, it hasn't been really explored because in order to do, do SFT or so, you just, the world isn't that bad. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's bad I, I, enough. But it's not bad. But I think, as far as, as as the structure is concerned, I think there can be really weird stuff. So I mean, you can have polyfolds which look at some point they look like a two, and the next point they are zero. I mean, one dimension. Do you want to state like what uh, what the splicing is in the retraction language and how that guarantees that? I mean, in general, you have a, uh, a better structure in terms of what your polyfolds are going to look like. I don't know if that would help in this case, but that, that at least. So what Joel's referring to is that this particular retract that I've written down has this special structure, which is that it's a family of um, of linear retractions, and there are certain things that are true for. Um, these special kinds of retracts, which are called scale splicings, that aren't true for general scale retracts. In but all I think, applications. Yeah, and in all applications currently, um, scale splicings are what appear. And m I think my philosophical point of view, correct me if I'm wrong, Helmut, is that um, like perhaps there are truly awful scale retracts, like the Cantor set, I don't know. Um, but I don't think we should worry too much about them. We should worry about 
what do we need for our applications and are polyfolds flexible to flexible enough to encompass them? So I think this one is relevant because it's really similar to the retract that you get coming from plus glue. I don't know, you don't think you can go to a tangent space to a canter so. <laughs> is it not is there more, more something subtle and it's I'm just saying something stupid to be able, you you asked or the the mystery is whether uh, the dimension of tangent space at the origin of that phase is it not just one because if I like ignore that they're really all pasted together, the origin is coming from the real line only? Yes. That's correct. Yeah. And I guess you can actually see it very easily from from the formula there. Okay, uh, if there are no questions, I can, I can say something hopefully useful. Um, Is there a sort of semi-continuity of local dimension? Can it only go up or only go down? Or no such property is true? Oops. Yeah. Depending um, which direction you come, you answer the question. <laughs> no, of tangent space. Well, so, okay, here's the answer to the dimensions of the tangent space. For every point in there with t less than or equal to zero, it's one, and for every point to the right, it's two. So then, so you could conjecture that you have, um, l what is it, semi-continuity going down, so you can jump down. So, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. But that's sort of this complementary, so complementary Ah, right, yeah, really okay. But that is yeah, so the example that Dusa mentioned where you replace beta by one minus beta, of course, the dimensions would be infinite, but you can you can so see that you'd sort of have the opposite kind of semi-continuity with that. Um, okay. All right. Um, so, last chance for questions, or else I'll say something for the remaining five minutes of lecture or discussion. Sorry. Can I ask? Like, maybe this is completely stupid, but could polyfolds, you think, just think, go beyond SFT, like use them for something else? Um, I think that that's a hope of H, W, and Z. But um, I don't know whether there are any particular examples they have in mind. Well, I'm happy when I'm done with SFT for the moment, but, but it's clear. <laughs> what about Jayon's thesis, or are we talking more general? Well, I mean, I don't know if you would include Lagrangian Fleur theory in whatever notion of SFT you have in mind, but I, I interpret it as, can you construct things that are not moduli spaces of J-holomorphic curves as we're right. using that? Could it, yeah. like, stand on its own, so to speak? Sure, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's actually, for a lot of bubbling off, you know, I mean, they do geometric flows and so on, it's precisely this kind of language which you need if you want to sort of describe in this way. So I think that there are a lot of problems in nonlinear analysis where they have this bubbling off, but where they, there they haven't actually, I think because of the questions they ask themselves, not developed a good language for uh, a lot of the things they are also non-generic, and you would like to do, for example, some moxie with minimal surfaces and certain things hasn't been carried out, and, I, I, and all, or only under certain conditions or more geometrically and so on, whereas I think uh, they, there was, they never developed any abstract methods to perturb, which actually would at least allow you to count certain things. So I think there's actually a lot of, of, of possibilities for application of something like that. I guess in a strict sense, the answer to your question is yes, because Morse theory certainly could be framed in terms of polyfolds. Uh, you have a question? Okay. All right. So the last thing I wanted to say is um, I thought that it m might be mysterious to some people what the point of partial quadrants are. Um, so I thought I'd say just a couple of words about that. So, right. So what's the point of looking at spaces like... Can everyone see this right here? Uh, and this answer to the question of why do we consider partial quadrants is what happens if we're trying to construct a moduli space of j holomorphic curves and we want to construct a local chart near something with nodes. Um, 
Yes, boundary nodes. So say we're doing Lagrangian flurry theory. So we're looking at holomorphic curves with boundary on Lagrangians. Um, and we try to construct a local chart near something with a boundary node. So something looking like you know, something like that. Um, and then The local chart near a map like this is going to be of the form um, 0, 1 times or times some space of, fu space of functions. And the answer is that, or the reason that this is um, the right sort of local chart is that um, we, of course, want nearby maps nearby maps to this guy to include where we've smoothed out the node. And smoothing out the node is a one parameter operation corresponding to you know, how much it gets pinched. And when the gluing parameter, which lives in here, goes to zero, you get actual nodal maps. So anyway, so that's where the partial quadrant definition is coming from, or at least it's one place that it comes from. Um, and as a closing question for the audience, if you haven't thought about this question before Monday, let me ask you the following question. So say I take um, some map with an interior node, so something that looks something like that. Um, so a map like this is going to have degeneracy index 1, um, just because this is the local chart. and when you go all the way to zero, you get a nodal map. Um, but the question is, what should the degeneracy, or what's the expected degeneracy index of a map like this? Uh, sorry, I missed your question. The question is, um, if you construct a local polyfold chart near a map like that, then what do you think the degeneracy index of this map is? And let me remind you that there are two gluing parameters, one neck length parameter and one angular twisting parameter for gluing at that node. Can you take a vote between 0, 1, and 2? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> 0? You can't vote if you knew it before Monday. 1 and 2. Do we all know which Jerry's index is? Uh, can you ever say the degeneracy index quickly, or is it not quick? Yes. So, um, so if you take um, a, a, a local chart, um, then for this particular chart, the degeneracy index corresponds to how much of the parameters living in um, the 0, 1 of the k are 0. And then to get the degeneracy index of a point in a polyfold, you take the minimum over all charts. Um, so anyway, the answer is 0. And the reason that it's 0 and not 2 is that the gluing parameters for this node live in a, in a disk. So the distinguished point at 0 corresponds to nodal maps. And if you move away from 0, then you're gluing the node. So in fact, this is an interior point of the disk, so the degener degeneracy index will be zero. Well, actually, also, we were just busy putting a chart there, a single chart. We shouldn't have any, right? I mean, with our retract that we did with the plus gluing, we were putting a single chart on which had no quadratic structure at all. Yes, right? yeah, indeed. Right. Okay. So, so I have a question as well. So, when you define the degeneracy index, you, you, take, you, you take the minimum, right? Because you can have different charts, so it's the point belongs to different base corners or whatever, right? So, I mean, even in this case, if, if you have a hypothetical chart which look like, I don't know, zero, 1 to 2 or something, then you can just say that the degeneracy index is uh, uh, at most something, right? Yeah, so you, you would need to make some kind of proof in a particular situation that there wouldn't be some other chart where you'd have a lower degeneracy index. Sure. OK, I will stop there.